So here's our third part in the genes lecture, going over how genes get expressed. So the DNA turns into the RNA, the RNA turns into the proteins, or we call it the amino acids, polypeptide chain, etc. It's the physical expression, eye color, hair color, height, weight, etc. So in the last couple lectures, we were talking about some of the scientists involved in this, some of the information they discovered to help us get to where we're at today, and then also the basics of how it works. In the last lecture, we were covering the basics of prokaryotic replication and how prokaryotic cells do this because it's a little, just a little bit different. Um, what we see with prokaryotic transcription it's coupled to translation, meaning they're, they're basically connected and locked together as that process occurs. So it's locked together a little bit more closely than what we see in eukaryotic, uh, the eukaryotic type of DNA to RNA to the amino acid chain process or transcription translation. So a term that I want you guys to be familiar with, you'll definitely be using this a little bit throughout this unit, but when you guys go on into upper level genetics, the term operon is going to be coming back to you. <clears throat> so an operon is a grouping of functionally related genes. So we'll say, oh, you have an operon for cell shape, an operon for the uh, proteins that act as receptors on your membranes, etc. So an operon Again, is this grouping of genes that work together. So it's a team, in a sense, a team of genes that work together to produce a certain function within the cell or for the cell. So keep that in mind as we look at this entire process of transcription, translation, and how genes work. So now when we look at eukaryotic cells, our cells, animal cells, plant cells, fungal cells, and the protistas, as they go through transcription, so they're taking the DNA and turning it into RNA, they're actually going to use three different polymerases, three different RNA polymerases. There's the rRNA, there's the mRNA, and the tRNA. So the polymerase creates each of these structures. So different players, but they're all working together to create the structures associated with transcription inside of our nucleus. So keep that in mind when we're looking at transcription in our body, it happens inside of the nucleus. So your DNA is kept in the nucleus and it is turned into RNA within the nucleus of the cell. So the modified RNA is what will actually leave the cell. And what we'll see happen is the RNA strand that was transcribed from the DNA gets modified into this thing called mature mRNA. And the modification involves adding these caps to it. So little hats, if you want to call it that. So there's a five prime cap that goes on here, a three prime tail, we call it the poly A tail, because it's a bunch of adenines here that gets added to the RNA strand and the mature mRNA after it's removed pieces of non-coding information. <clears throat> so fill in the blank here. Let me put a star because this is definitely an important term. The fill in the blank word is called an intron. Introns are the pieces of your RNA that get removed. So DNA transcribes into RNA, and then chunks of the RNA get removed. At this point, we don't know what that RNA does. It's considered non-coding sequences, and we call them introns because they are left inside of the nucleus. They stay inside the nucleus. Okay, so introns, very important term to remember when we're dealing with the RNA strand. So the introns get removed, the RNA gets modified, gets a cap and a tail, <clears throat> and then that RNA will leave the nucleus. 
Okay, so here's a little bit better of an example or a diagram of what's happening with the modification. So introns, these are sections of the RNA that stay inside of the nucleus. So the way the diagram's working, this represents the introns, the eyes, the purple color. The blue is what we call exons. So the DNA transcribes into this big long RNA strand. And this piece of DNA, what we call the exon, turns to yellow, the purple stays purple, blue to yellow, purple, purple, etc. And you have this piece of RNA information here. Before it leaves the nucleus, chop out each of these purple sections, the introns. Chop them out, remove them, leave them inside the nucleus. They stay in. The strand then gets repackaged slightly, basically condensed down into what we call mature mRNA. So notice it's all yellow. This is the exon information. That is what will physically leave your nucleus. It actually goes out of the nucleus through those tiny little nuclear holes or nuclear pores and will go into the cytoplasm of the cell and specifically if we're trying to build proteins it goes to the ribosome, the protein factory. Okay, So every time the DNA goes through transcription translation it has to transcribe into RNA, clean up the RNA, chop out certain pieces, and send only the condensed, we could call it the good code, out of the nucleus. Introns stay in, we don't know what they code for. Exons exit the nucleus, that will code for your amino acids. All right, so in the big picture, there's some big information. A gene is a unit of information. On average, genes range from 2,000 to 4,000 base pairs. That's the rough size of a gene. It takes 2,000 to 4,000 pieces of DNA information to create a gene. It is estimated, and I say estimated because this number keeps changing, it's estimated there are about 25,000 genes sitting in the human genome. What makes up a human? roughly 25,000 genes. So we have six feet of DNA. That DNA can express roughly 25,000 genes. Now some of the genes are monohybrids, dominant recessive traits or variations. Some of them are incomplete dominance genes. Some of them are codominance, like blood typing. Some are sex linked, like hemophilia or color blindness. And other genes are simply polygenic, where we go, wow, it takes six of these genes to equal one trait, like height and skin color, or sometimes they're pleiotropic, where you have one gene that expresses multiple traits, like sickle cell anemia. This is why we really don't know exactly how many genes we have. But that number used to be 100,000 genes. That was the estimation when the Human Genome Project started, and now it's been dialed down to about 25,000. And we'll revisit this when we get into the Human Genome Lecture. We'll take a look at where the project started, what information we have, and the hopeful future for that project. If you guys are interested in this, Wash U in St. Louis does a lot with the Human Genome Project. So it might be a school to check out as you transfer and go on for a bachelor's, master's, PhD type of programs. So all right, so 25,000 genes in our genome. We have approximately 100,000 plus proteins associated with our cell. So those proteins are all made from the genes that are contained in our DNA. So lot and lot and lots of information here when we talk about genetics. All right, so as we're making our DNA, or taking our DNA, turning it into RNA, turning it into the proteins, there are certain structures associated with it that we want to make sure we remember. A couple of the key structures are tRNA. It's a type of RNA we call transfer RNA. It looks kind of like a little letter T, lowercase t. 
and the bottom of it has a hook that holds a particular amino acid to it. So the hook here, sorry, the hook up is up on this side on this image. The hook up here carries and holds a specific amino acid. The portion here is what will match up to what is on your R and A strand and create the match, what we call the codon match, to then deliver the specific amino acid. So the ribosomes, that's that brownish, grayish, whatever we want to call it, structure here, the ribosome reads this information. It reads the RNA strand, and then it says, hey, Mr. or Miss tRNA, bring me methionine. Bring me serine. Bring me valine. It's going to request specific amino acids based on this code here. The transfer RNA carries it over, hands off the amino acid to the ribosome, and the ribosome forms the polypeptide. We call it the protein chain. Maybe it's a first level protein, maybe it's a second, third, fourth. It's going to vary based upon what information is in the DNA when it says start and when it says stop with this process. Okay, so here's the overview of the process. This is it, the RNA strand going through the ribosome. There's different sites on the ribosome. And don't get too worked up over these for, for my purposes. Later, future courses, yeah you'll get worked up over them. But the A site, P site, E site, there's a large ribosomal subunit, the small subunit. <clears throat> Basically, this is all working together to build a protein, to build this polypeptide chain. So initiation says, boom, let's get this started. Let's get the pathway going. Let's put that first amino acid down. That is always, always going to be methionine. Let's then elongate and add additional amino acids to the chain. Let's keep extending. Here's another one, another one, and another one. And then eventually they hit one of those three termination codons and they say, all right, we're done. That's it. We've got all the amino acids we need. Shut down. The ribosome is told to stop calling for amino acids. The protein is assembled and it gets shipped by the Golgi body or transported to wherever it's needed within the cell. Okay, so very, very organized and sequenced type of process here when we look at the uh, translation aspect. Okay, so just a little bit of a magnification on it. Here's the RNA going through. Here are the ribosomes, or the large section, small section of the ribosome. Here are the tRNAs bringing over the amino acids, and then here's the termination, what we call the release factor. It locks in and says, boom, done. That was the last one you needed to do. There's the last amino acid. Okay, pop that chain off, and then the ribosome actually just breaks apart, disassociates, splits apart. It says, okay, let's wait until we come back to this part of the cell cycle, and we'll do this all over again. All right, so a lot of different structures involved here. And here's just another overview, looking at as it builds it, then it, the ribosome actually attaches to the ER and releases that protein. So then the protein, here's our protein sitting out here, that can go wherever the cell needs it to go. So the cell's genetics will dictate what happens to that protein and where that particular protein is shipped based upon what it can do. All right, so again, a nice summary overview. Don't hang yourselves up on all the intricate little steps and the little details. I want you to know big picture, what goes in, what comes out, how this pathway works, what's the general process of this particular pathway. All right, again, later courses, you'll get into a lot more finite detail with how transcription and translation work. So what we're going to talk about in our next lecture here will be mutations. What happens when the genes get altered and something changes?